Hey there, this is Alex. Before we start with the thrilling conclusion to Sertorius, I've got two announcements. First is just my own invitation to you to sign up for our email list at ancientlifecoach.com. It's free, no spam. I just send out a weekly email of some of my favorite stories, insights, and analysis from ancient life and culture. Second is that I'm very pleased to have a guest narrator today. Her name is Dr. Anika Prather. Anika is an entrepreneur, educator, and performing artist who is very involved in the classical education movement in the U.S. She's a founder of the Living Water School, which offers classical-inspired programming for independent learners, formerly a brick-and-mortar institution in Maryland, now fully online. She also teaches classical literature at Howard University in Washington, D.C., where she also did her undergraduate work. Find out more about her in the show notes and on our website. She's a fan of Plutarch, and she'll be reading a couple of passages from Plutarch for us in this episode, so listen for that. In the early 19th century, the Spanish and Portuguese were fighting for control of their native lands against the occupying forces of Napoleonic France. They were outnumbered and outgunned against Bonaparte's highly trained regular soldiers, so they resorted to a very ancient form of warfare, but gave it a new name, guerrilla, which in Spanish means little war, where we get our word guerrilla. As one man fighting in the French army at the time put it, wherever we arrived, they disappeared, and whenever we left, they arrived. They were everywhere and nowhere. In the American War of Independence, the most famous practitioner of these tactics against the British was Francis Marion, the Swamp Fox of South Carolina. The British were exasperated. They tried to challenge Marion. They said, come out and fight like a Christian. After these men, there were Shea and Mao. But before all of them, there was Sertorius. This is the third and final part of the life of Sertorius. I'm Alex Petkus, and you are listening to The Cost of Glory. When we last left Sertorius, he had found himself on the losing side of the first great Roman civil war. Sulla, his arch enemy, took control of Rome and declared Sertorius and all of his friends public enemies. Many were executed, many fled the city, and scattered all over the Mediterranean. Sertorius knew that if he could secure a stable power base, word would get out, and the many survivors of Sulla's reactionary terror might gather and come join him. The way he saw it, they were counting on him. But he had just been driven out of his province of Spain by a powerful Roman commander, Aeneas, and he hadn't even managed to get a toehold anywhere. And so... When he was in the pit of despair, hunted by Aeneas' fleet on the edge of annihilation, seeing no other way forward, he threw in his lot with a very unlikely set of allies, men who he shared a common enemy with, pirates. Men from Cilicia, way back east, which at that time was a noted pirate capital. Now, pirates can be useful, but they are fickle too. But this was his best shot for now. So Sertorius and the pirates drive out a force that Aeneas has stationed on the island of Ibiza, which was called Pitiusa back then. But this gets Aeneas's attention, and pretty soon he comes himself with a huge fleet and 5,000 marines. There's a sea battle, and they had a shot. Sertorius at least now has some serious seafaring men on his side. But pirate ships back then were designed for raiding, not naval warfare. And what's worse, the weather turns against Sertorius, so he and his pirate allies lose the battle and they escape. But once again, they have no friendly territory to land on, and now they are trying to elude a large and determined imperial navy. And now a storm is whipping up the sea, and Sertorius and his little fleet just sail around, getting seasick for ten whole days. Was Neptune angry with them for turning on their countrymen? And as Sertorius is once more in deep trouble, wondering how he's ever going to get a stable foot back on Spain, to say nothing of retaking Rome, they encounter sailors who have just returned from some exotic islands in the Atlantic Ocean. And these sailors tell of 
warm breezes year-round, fertile soil, gentle rains, clean air, fruit just growing on the trees, right around eye level, ripe for the picking. No inhabitants, no pirates, no Roman Empire. Sounds like paradise. They were probably talking about the Canary Islands, actually. And so after many battles on land and sea, so much Roman blood spilt, all this hostility from his countrymen, Sertorius is really ready to throw in the towel. He wants to hang up his armor and settle down on a little island plantation, not bother anyone, not be bothered, raise some goats. And so Sertorius, in all seriousness, proposes to his coalition that they just go and live on these islands, leave the war behind. He paints them a picture of what it could be like. What do you think, guys? The pirates laugh at him. Then the laughter stops. Are you kidding? You coward. We didn't join up with you to pipe away on our pan flutes in your little bucolic fantasy. They want action. They want loot. They tell him, well, if he's going to be that way, they're going to be off then. And they inform him that they've just heard about a certain young Mauritanian nobleman named Ascalus, whose father used to be the king way back when, and now he's trying to take back the throne from the current king. And they're going to sail back to North Africa, help this Ascalus guy out, help him take back the kingdom, and, you know, get paid and probably pillage a little bit as a bonus. This should be easy. And, by the way, Sulla is backing Ascalus too, so it's a pretty sure thing. And they sail away. Now, they must have said something that really pissed him off, because Sertorius decides to abandon his tropical island retirement plan and follow right behind them and take up arms against them and Ascalus. And what does he have now, 2,500 men or so? So, he lands in North Africa there, and uh, the Mauritanians and their king gladly accept his help. They view Ascalus as an illegitimate usurper, of course. Sertorius defeats the usurper Ascalus and the pirates in a battle, chases Ascalus into the walled city that he's near, and he bottles him up in a siege. Then, a Roman commander, sent by Sulla, lands in Africa. Guy's there to help Ascalus. Sertorius defeats him too. He kills the guy in battle. And then he convinces the man's troops to join his own cause. Ascalus, the usurper, sees no hope. He surrenders the city. Sertorius graciously allows him to flee. Mission accomplished. Sertorius now has a toehold, a spot of dirt where he can sleep in peace for a while and collect himself. Now then at this point, Sertorius and his newly enlarged army, they certainly have the muscle now to force more concessions from the Mauritanians. He can even make himself king of the place if he wants. I mean, considering the circumstances, who would blame him? But as usual, Sertorius is playing the long game, and he abides by the terms of the agreement exactly that he made with the locals, restores to them their government, and leaves them in peace. And Sertorius showed great respect for the locals, too, and their customs. For example, the city Ascalus surrendered was called Tingis, modern-day Tangier, in northern Morocco. That's right across the strait from Spain. And Sertorius now has some time to get to know the place, and he's talking to the locals, and they tell him an incredible story about a giant buried there. Now, the legendary Greek hero Hercules was once forced to complete 12 great labors. One of those labors was to slay a giant named Antaeus. Antaeus was a son of Gaia, the earth, and Poseidon, god of the sea. Antaeus forced passersby to wrestling matches, and when he inevitably defeated them, he would kill them, and he was building a temple to his father Poseidon out of their skulls. When along came Hercules. Antaeus also had a secret weakness. He drew his strength from physical contact with the earth. And when they got to fighting, Hercules figured this out. And so to defeat him, he lifted him off the ground first, breaking that contact with the earth, the source of his strength. And then Hercules crushed the giant to death with some kind of killer bear hug. And Tangier was the place where Antaeus was supposed to be buried. And Sertorius was informed by the locals that there was in fact a great tomb in honor of Antaeus there, containing the skeleton that he left behind. And Sertorius listens to them, and reasonably, he says, well, that's pretty far-fetched, isn't it? And they say, no, really, it's true. So he decides to test the story. He has his troops dig up the grave, and lo and behold, 
they find a skeleton 60 cubits tall, 100 feet tall. Sertorius was amazed, and, well, what else is he supposed to do at that point? Obviously, he has the bones reburied, and he makes a pious sacrifice to the spirit of the dead giant. At least, that's the story they tell, according to Plutarch. But Sertorius's restraint in abiding by his word, instead of commandeering this little kingdom, it immediately pays off, because, as he and his associates are trying to figure out what to do next, emissaries come to them from the Lusitanians, who were looking for a leader they could trust. Now, the Lusitanians were a federation of tribes from the rugged regions of the central and western Iberian Peninsula. Their terrain covered the northern parts of modern Portugal and also western Spain. The Roman provinces in the peninsula at this time mainly consisted of the coastline on the other side, on the east and the south, and then a few days journey inland. And the Romans had made some inroads, but the Lusitanians had been some of the toughest people to pacify on the peninsula for the Romans. There was a huge, notorious uprising in the previous generation under a very charismatic chieftain. The Lusitanians were kind of wild. The Greek geographer Strabo, writing around this time, tells us that the Lusitanians liked to prophesy the future by gutting their prisoners alive and inspecting their entrails. But these Lusitanians had heard of Sertorius and his impressive skills as a commander, and they were looking for someone they could trust, someone who might be willing to help them to defend themselves against the abuses of those other Romans. And here's what Plutarch says. When they learned about his character from those who had been with him, they entrusted themselves to him and to him alone. And it is said that Sertorius was no easy victim either of pleasure or of fear, but that at his core he was unshaken in the face of dangers and bore prosperity with moderation. In straightforward fighting, he was as bold as any commander of his time, but in all military activities demanding stealth and the power to seize an advantage in securing strong positions or in crossing rivers where speed, deceit, and, if necessary, falsehood are required, he was an expert of the highest ability. And so the Lusitanians were really primed to appreciate Sertorius's particular skill set. They were themselves renowned for things like lying in ambush, spying, and nimble battle tactics. They were used to sleeping on the ground, bathing in cold water, eating one meal a day. But while Sertorius was trying to decide how to respond to this new request, he received news that his mother had died back in Italy. And this hit him very hard. He withdrew to his tent, refused to come out or see anyone. He didn't give any instructions on what to do in his absence. His staff officers and friends pleaded with him. But no, this went on for seven days. What was he thinking during that time? Was he reflecting on his whole life story? He had achieved a great deal. Nobody could laugh at this son of a turnip farmer from Nursia now. Or could they? It looked like his enemies had won. Sulla and the Metelli were running the show in Rome. They had repopulated the Senate with their cronies. Nobody dared bring up the topic of social reforms now. All his friends were scattered. Would he ever see his hometown again? Maybe he was wondering if all this fighting was all worth it. Was this what that tough old lady had raised him for? And Plutarch sees his retreat into his tent here as one of many indications that Sertorius was actually very reluctant to take up arms against his fatherland, that he was even a peaceable man by disposition, that he was forced unwillingly into that life of a soldier that he excelled in. But maybe, maybe, he was just thinking it all through in exacting detail about how he was going to take back Spain. Because when he finally left his tent, all his doubts were resolved. There was no going back or giving up now. He summoned the Lusitanians. He was grateful and would like to accept their offer of leadership. But the condition was they were not going to drive Rome out of Spain. They were going to restore Rome from Spain. 
beginning with Spain, and he would give them a place of honor in the renewed state. So the new coalition crossed back over the straits into Iberia. There was a sea battle en route and a couple of battles with Roman commanders who tried to stop him once he landed in Spain. He had to demolish a pro-Sola army by the Guadalquivir River. But they made their way soon into that rugged Lusitanian heartland in the west with minimal losses. And then Sertorius set about training up his native army. He knew that Sulla and his new puppet senate wouldn't tolerate a rebel general in Spain for too long. He knew that he had to school his troops in Roman military ways. That meant a change in mindset, even a sort of change in identity. They learned Roman signals, formations. They drilled and drilled. And Sertorius knew the power uniforms have on psychology, so he commanded his Spaniards to ornament their helmets with gold and silver. He had them embroider their war cloaks, and so... Through all these methods, he was converting them from being a rowdy coalition of brave and furious, but actually kind of ineffective tribal skirmishers into a deadly, highly disciplined Roman guerrilla strike force. Now, it wasn't like all the natives immediately rallied to his cause. He had to employ certain stratagems to get them to follow him. For example, a certain admiring local villager brought to Sertorius as a gift an albino fawn. At first, Sertorius just admired it, but as he got to know the animal and thought about it, he started to see its practical potential. The doe grew older, and he trained her to follow him wherever he went. She started to obey the sound of his voice. She could stay calm in the loud clamor of life in a military camp. Pretty unusual for a deer. So he started casually insinuating here and there in such a way that his faith seemed to grow. My, what a numinous creature. And eventually, he began proclaiming it outright that this doe was actually a divine gift from the hunter goddess Diana. He would swear that it mystically revealed things to him. He guessed that these people were very inclined to superstition. I'm sure they had their own hunter goddess and that he learned her name. And all this made quite an impression on them. And the natives started to think that they were being led not just by some enterprising foreigner, but by the wisdom of a god. So it came to be that whenever he received some secret intelligence from a source, a spy, let's say, he would attribute it to the doe. Say the enemy was making incursions into their territory, he would pretend that the doe had come and spoken to him in his dreams. Diana is warning us to keep our forces ready. Or when he got word of some victory from one of his commanders winning a battle, he would conceal the messenger, pay them to keep quiet, and then he'd bring out the doe wearing flower garlands, you know, victory wreaths, and he'd announce, Diana has prophesied to me through this divine doe that we will soon receive glad tidings, and so get ready a thanksgiving sacrifice to the gods. This was all very effective not because he was some sort of medicine man, but because he was a brilliant warrior. And so from that little strike force that he crossed the straits with, some 2,600 Romans, 700 Africans, and 4,000 Lusitanians with a few hundred cavalry, and with no outside funds, he built up a war machine that was capable of taking on a more serious challenge. And they didn't have to wait long. After various Spanish governor commanders had failed, Lord Sulla, back in Rome, decided to take more drastic measures. He was going to sort out this Sertorius problem once and for all. He dispatched Metellus. Sertorius personally knew the man sent to destroy him pretty well. Quintus Caecilius Metellus Pius. He was, after Sulla, the grandest and most powerful Roman of his day. He was now the patriarch of the Metelli family. His cousin was Sulla's wife. His dad was Marius's old commander, Metellus Numidicus, the elder, the guy Marius had gotten exiled in 100. This Metellus, Metellus the Younger, was no young man now. He was a proud, war-hardened general, he had fought with distinction in Numidia, fought in the social war against the Italians. 
And now in the recent civil war, Metellus had crushed the allies of Sertorius and the Populares in southern Gaul. He had overseen the execution of many a rebel, and he was looking forward to adding another to the long list. When Metellus arrived in Spain, he sent a subordinate commander, a legate, to destroy Sertorius, as though he had more important things to do. Sertorius quickly routed this army and killed the commander in battle. Metellus quickly realized that he was going to have to do this himself. And then, wildly outnumbered, Sertorius began defeating Metellus and his army over countless engagements. Sertorius called him the Old Lady, and he really brought Metellus to his wit's end. Here's Plutarch again. Metellus was carrying on war with a man of daring who evaded every kind of open fighting and who made all manner of shifts and changes. Owing to the light equipment and agility of his Iberian soldiers, whereas Metellus himself had been trained in regular contests of heavy armed troops and was used to commanding a ponderous and immobile phalanx, which, for repelling and overpowering an enemy at close quarters, was most excellently trained. But for climbing mountains, for dealing with the incessant pursuits and flights of men as light as the winds, and for enduring hunger and a life without fire or tent, as their enemies did, it was worthless. Besides this, Metellus was now getting on in years and was somewhat inclined also by this time to an easy and luxurious mode of life after his many and great contests. Whereas his opponent, Sertorius, was full of mature vigor and had a body which was wonderfully constituted for strength, speed, and plain living. He would not indulge in drink, even in his hours of ease. He was used to enduring great toils, long marches, and continuous wakefulness, content with meager and indifferent food. Moreover, since he was always wandering about or hunting when he had leisure for it, he obtained an acquaintance with every way of escape for a fugitive or of surrounding an enemy under pursuit. The essence of guerrilla warfare, in the words of Mao Zedong, is withdraw when the enemy advances, harass him when he stops, strike him when he is wary, and pursue him when he withdraws. And as Che Guevara put it, the guerrilla relies on mobility. He must be physically tough and capable of enduring extremes in deprivation of food, water, clothing, shelter. And that's just what Sertorius did, using his little Lusitanian Roman strike force against the regular Roman troops. So Metellus is having a hell of a time, and Sertorius senses at some point that the enemy soldiers were really getting exhausted. So he sends a messenger to challenge him to a one-on-one, -on -one, winner-take-all, duel-to-the-death, general-with-general, Roman-with-Roman. Metellus's troops roar in approval. Metellus, wisely, as Plutarch says, declines. His troops ridiculed him, but he laughed it off. And so the game continued. So just to give you an example of the kinds of tactics Sertorius would use... There was a certain Lusitanian city that was allied with Sertorius, giving him assistance. Metellus wanted to crush these rebels and make an example of them. This city had only one measly well within the walls. That was not going to be enough water if they were under siege. So Metellus heads to the city to siege it. He thinks, this will be quick work. They'll capitulate in two, maybe three days. He only has his soldiers bring five days of supplies. But Sertorius is on to him. He has a network of spies and scouts. He comes up with a plan to help the city out with their water issue. Before Metellus gets to the city, Sertorius sends out a whisper to the surrounding region. He's offering a high price for leather skins filled with water, and he quickly gets 2,000 of them. Then he calls for strong and fast volunteers to deliver them, about 1,000 men. The orders were first to go deliver the water bags to the city, and then escort or carry away any civilians in the city who weren't going to be fighting. Women, children, the elderly. And they finish and they're gone well before Metellus arrives. 
So, Metellus begins his siege, but by the time he realizes what's going on, that the city is being manned by a lean fighting force that has plenty of water to hold out a long time, he's out of provisions himself. So, he sends out 6,000 men to go forage nearby, and then Sertorius, with 3,000 men, lays an ambush for them on their way back. He kills some, captures most of the rest, and suffers minimal losses. Metellus retreats, cursing. And Sertorius kept doing things like this again and again. Natives continue to join his ranks. Over time, he grows his territory in Spain to encompass the majority of the peninsula. He wins allies from different sorts of tribes. The Celt-Iberians come back to his side again in much greater numbers than before. But these new recruits had to be disciplined in his art of winning by avoiding battle, or by what sometimes looked like retreating. In one episode, there was a band of new recruits. They're puffed up, complaining. They demand to engage with the enemy directly. They say, come on, we can take him. Sertorius decides to let them learn by experience. So he pretends not to notice when they charge out to face off with the Romans in a small, direct battle. And then when they start to get into trouble, of course, Sertorius comes with a larger force and rescues them. So he waits a few days after the rescue. The men are lying around in the camp, dejected, and he calls the soldiers together for a meeting. And then he stands two horses in front of the troops. One, a scrawny old nag with scraggly hair. One, a stout stallion in its prime with a beautiful thick tail. And he stood a brawny tall man by the shrimpy horse and a shrimpy little man by the brawny horse. And someone gives the signal and then the burly guy grabs hold of the old nag's ratty tail and starts yanking on it while the shrimpy man starts plucking the stout tail one hair at a time. And so, after some time of this, and I guess it must have taken a lot of patience from those horses, the wimpy guy has pulled out the entire tail's worth of hair from the big horse, and the muscly guy has accomplished nothing on the scraggly tail. And Sertorius speaks up and says, There you have it, friends. Many things that cannot be mastered when they stand together yield when someone takes them little by little. They got the message. When Sertorius was doing all this, he didn't want to just educate his new allies in the art of war. He wanted to lay the groundwork for after the war. So he took the sons of the most noble families, gathered them all together in one city, and he paid for these kids to be educated in Greek and Latin, a literary education. This was going to help them and their parents envision themselves as sharing in the administration and government of the state in the future once all the fighting subsided. And this was ambitious of him, visionary even, because this is really the beginning stages of the Romanization of Spain. And many great Roman emperors eventually came from Spain, Trajan, Hadrian, Theodosius, and educators too, like Quintilian, it was also clever strategically because Sertorius was following the ancient custom of taking hostages from your allies to ensure cooperation. He controls the gates of the city in which the boys are being educated. But then, not too long after Metellus arrived, there was a major shift in politics at Rome that had a substantial impact on Sertorius' efforts. Sulla died in the year 78 BC, and now... One of the consuls for the year was a longtime opponent of Sulla. Sulla had allowed some dissenters in the Senate. He knew it allowed people to tell themselves that they weren't living in a tyranny, which is important if you're a tyrant. But now, with Sulla dead, this dissenter became more vocal. He started demanding amnesty from the Senate for all of the prominent exiles who had been proscribed, but somehow had so far escaped being murdered. This new consul's name was Lepidus. And there were now debates in the Senate. Maybe we should let the exiles back. And this was precisely the kind of opportunity Sertorius had been holding out for. Maybe there could be a reconciliation if negotiations went the right way. So now, after his victorious battles, Sertorius started sending emissaries to Metellus to try to negotiate his own surrender. He offered to lay down arms 
and happily give up all prospect of any future office or honor on the condition that he and his fellow exiles be restored to citizenship. He said, I would rather live in Rome as its lowliest citizen than be called supreme ruler of the rest of the world. But Metellus refused. And then the Senate in Rome also took a vote and rejected Lepidus's request for amnesty for the exiles. The proscriptions remained in force. So Lepidus then decided to lead a full-scale revolt. He gathered a lot of disaffected parties. A lot of men came out of hiding. Men like a certain Marcus Perperna. Perperna was a proud and wealthy nobleman. He was the son and grandson of Roman consuls. He had been on Marius' side in the Civil War, and so he was proscribed by Sulla when Sulla took control of the city. And he had been trying to drum up resistance to Sulla for many years while he was in exile. He recruited rebel troops in Africa, and he joined up on Lepidus' side when he got the chance. So Lepidus marched on Rome at the head of a large army. But the other consul, a conservative, calls up Sulla's veteran armies out of retirement, Rome's finest, and he manages to defeat Lepidus in battle. Lepidus retreats with his forces to Sardinia, off the coast of northern Italy. They start to regroup, but then Lepidus gets sick and dies. And then the remnants of his army come under the control of this proud, exiled nobleman, Perperna. And now Perperna decides that the best chance for the resistance was now in Spain. So he heads in that direction to join up with Sertorius, and he brings along some 25,000 troops with him. Suddenly, to the senatorial regime in Rome, the threat building in Spain seemed a lot more serious. The Senate decides, with Metellus frazzled and Sertorius energized, and now with a big time boost of manpower on Sertorius's side, that they need to send another army there to help out Metellus. The new consuls for that year, who would be the first choice to lead the operation, they're looking at this. They see that defeating Sertorius and his new ally, Perperna, that's going to be pretty hard. And they're guessing that it's probably not going to bring in much plunder in the very uncertain case of success. So the consuls make some plausible excuses and decline the command. But one man sees the great opportunity in taking on this dirty job, and that is the 29-year-old Gnaeus Pompeius Magnus, otherwise known as Pompey the Great. This wasn't the first time Pompey had faced Sertorius. When Sertorius and Cinna had sieged Rome and retook it from the Optimates, it was Pompey's father, Pompeius Strabo, that Sertorius defeated outside the gates. Pompey had been in camp there with his dad. His father had tragically died by a lightning bolt strike. Actually, he was widely hated, so some people gave the glory to Jupiter for that one. But the young Pompey, at age 20, inherited his father's army and his vast estates, and quickly joined up with Sulla in the Civil War. So by his early 20s, Pompey had already led veteran armies with great success, and it was Sulla himself who gave the boy the epithet Magnus, that is, the Great. And the old men in Rome were also a little afraid of him. This was not the first unpleasant job he had volunteered for. One of his nicknames was Adolescentulus Carnifex, Kid Butcher. More on that in his biography. So Pompey, again, now about 29, he's on his way to Spain now. But Perperna gets there first. Now, Perperna's plan was actually not to join Sertorius as a subordinate. So he kept his forces at a distance. He wanted to work in concert with Sertorius, maybe even be his superior. At first, it's looking like the same old pattern Sertorius had wrestled with all his life. Big Roman elite ego refusing to defer to the competent commoner. Perperna certainly higher in social status than Sertorius if they were at Rome. Wealthy son of consuls and grandson of consuls versus Sabine gorilla. Which one would you invite to your dinner party? 
But of course they weren't in Rome, and once Perperna's troops heard that Pompey had crossed the Pyrenees and was headed straight for them, they forcefully demanded that Perperna lead them to join up with Sertorius. They figured they didn't have a chance unless Sertorius was leading them. Perperna acquiesced, but he resented it. Now, Perperna also brought with him many disaffected senators who had been supporters of Marius I and then Lepidus in his uprising. Sertorius sees an opportunity here, another sign that he really understood human psychology. He declares that this assembly of refugee nobles who had come to him is a new senate. So he has quaestors and praetors elected to give his cause a sense of legitimacy and purpose. This wasn't just a rebellion. This was the beginning of a new Roman state. And Plutarch points out that this is yet another sign of Sertorius's megalofrosune, literally his great mindedness. He also gave the new Roman arrivals official commands with proper titles, put them in charge of his Iberian forces. This was risky. It meant sharing his power, diluting it even, by entrusting components of this highly effective but also somewhat delicate war machine to other men, people who he hadn't yet perfectly trained in his peculiar ways of warfare. But he had to trust others if he was going to build up a real rival to Rome, a state that could represent legitimacy and justice to the lands and the people that it ruled, which was most of Spain for now, a state that could successfully withstand Rome, maybe one day peacefully integrate itself back into it, or, perhaps, failing that, strong enough to take it over by force. Hey, I hope you're enjoying the show. We'll get right back to it, but I want to take a moment to acknowledge one of our sponsors today. Some of the most transformative experiences I've had have been when I've had the opportunity to travel to a strange place with someone who really understood its culture and history in a deep way. So I'm really excited to have as a sponsor for this episode a company that does just this sort of thing for classical sites, the kind of places we mention often in the Cost of Glory podcast, places like Athens, Rome, Sicily, southern France, northern Greece. The Paideia Institute is a nonprofit educational company run and staffed by experts in the ancient Greco-Roman world. And they put on world-class tours for groups and individuals. I've been lucky enough to be a guest lecturer on more than one. They also offer online courses in the classical languages, that is Greek and Latin, which I think every English speaker should learn if they have an opportunity. Paideia is the Greek word for education. And the Paideia Institute also runs a number of programs to promote education. They do scholarships, after school programs, lots of good stuff. Check out their website at paideainstitute.org. That's P A I D E I A Institute.org. Now, all the pieces are on the chessboard for a massive, multi-front clash in Spain. Pompey and Metellus versus Sertorius and his coalition. And a number of months go by, moving pieces around on the board, the great armies maneuver back and forth, delaying, positioning, sizing each other up, waiting to see who would strike first. The party to make the first move, though, was a native Spaniard city near the east coast called Lauron. Lauron defects from Sertorius to Pompey. Pompey rushes to the city's aid with his army of 30,000 men. He wants to set a positive example for other cities to follow. Sertorius follows on his heels and moves into position. He lures Pompey into an ambush and destroys a third of his army in a single day with minimal losses. Sertorius has totally mastered the terrain mentally, and he makes it look easy. But Pompey keeps his cool, keeps his poise. Then Sertorius tricks Pompey again. He takes a position on a nearby hill that was visible from the walls of Lauron. Pompey gloats. What an idiot. He surrounds Sertorius on the hill, and he sends word to the town of Lauron, reassuring them that they are in good hands. He said, Get up on the ramparts and watch as I teach this old man a lesson. And then when Sertorius got report of this from a scout, he laughed and said, I think I'll be the one to offer a lesson to Sulla's little schoolboy. 
and on his signal, a legion of 6,000 heavily armed troops come out from a position of hiding behind Pompey's forces. If he attacked either of Sertorius's positions, the other one would rout him from behind. And so, without a drop of blood spilled, Sertorius calmly sends word to the city of Lauron and accepts its surrender without a fight. He lets all of the inhabitants go free, but he burns the city to the ground. It wasn't out of spite, but he did this to shame Pompey and his admirers. So word quickly spreads around Spain that even though Pompey was near at hand and practically warming himself by the flames of an allied city, he did nothing to relieve it. And now, it looked like Sertorius was at the height of his power, and a new opportunity opened up to him. Emissaries arrived on a ship from the east. They wanted to speak with Sertorius, and they came with a message from the man who Marius and Sulla had fought over who got to lead an army against him, the wily king of Pontus, Mithridates. He was still at large. Sulla had actually been in a hurry to get back to Rome all those years ago in the Civil War, and he ended that conflict with Mithridates by a treaty. He hadn't really finished the job. And Mithridates had a message for Sertorius. He was hearing all of these people talking about Sertorius, comparing Sertorius to Hannibal and so on. And so Mithridates sees an opportunity to strike a deal. He wants to join forces against their common enemy, the tyrannical oligarchy in Rome. But he has his own demands, of course. Mithridates proposes that Sertorius confirm the Pontian king's right to occupy a number of territories in his own region in the east, and especially that Roman province called Asia. In Roman parlance, this was the western coast of Turkey. It had long been a Roman province, and Mithridates captured it, but Sulla forced him to relinquish it. Very rich. Mithridates wanted it back. In return, Mithridates was offering to provide Sertorius with ships and money to carry on his war, ships and money that he desperately needed. Well, Sertorius consulted his senate. They all said, do it, man. They were being asked to grant a name and an empty title for something that they didn't even possess, and in return they were being offered what they needed the most. But Sertorius refused. He said that Mithridates was welcome to take back certain previously non-Roman provinces that Sulla had extorted from him in the treaty, namely Cappadocia and Bithynia. These were really not Rome's business. But Asia was by right the property of the Roman people. Sertorius said he refused to increase his own power at the cost of permanently decreasing the Roman state. The emissaries go back with the message. And Mithridates, upon hearing Sertorius's response, said to his friends, Well, what terms will Sertorius dictate to us when he is seated on the Palatine in Rome, if even now, as an exile on the shores of the Atlantic, he sets bounds to our kingdom? Mithridates nonetheless agreed, and they ratified a treaty with oaths. He sent 3,000 talents of silver. A talent is maybe 70 pounds, 30 kilograms, so that's a lot of money, 70 of those. Also, 40 ships. Sertorius sent a Roman general to help advise Mithridates and also a small force to accompany him. Meanwhile, Sertorius continued to make progress in Spain, as long as he kept pursuing his policy of avoiding direct pitched battles and using his opponent's overconfidence against them. One historian estimates that out of that initial band of a few thousand that had crossed the straits from Africa, Sertorius had grown his side into a force which numbered between 60 and 80,000 troops. But his forces were divided into several smaller armies in Spain, commanded by various lieutenants of his. And as the great Roman general Fabius Maximus had learned in the conflict with Hannibal, it's very difficult to convince other Roman commanders to commit fully to guerrilla tactics. It was foreign to their mindset, seemed craven, barbaric. It wasn't the way their forefathers had won the empire. And in fact, even though the Romans had worn Hannibal down with guerrilla warfare, that wasn't how they eventually defeated him. Now, Sertorius's commander in the south, Hertulaeus, probably his best lieutenant, had explicit orders not to engage Metellus. 
in a direct pitched battle. Hertileus disobeyed. We don't know why. Maybe he thought he saw an opportunity. Maybe his staff officers demanded it. Either way, he challenged Metellus in a pitch battle in 76 BC, and Metellus annihilated his army. Maybe 20,000 fighting men were lost. Hertileus did escape with his life, so over the winter, Sertorius helped him raise another army of new recruits from among the Lusitanians, and he must have given him a proper scolding, but... The following year at Segovia, Hertileus made the same mistake, and this time it cost him his life. Perperna, the proud exiled nobleman who had recently brought reinforcements to Spain, he volunteered for Hertileus' job. But Sertorius already had a different candidate in mind. Perperna's resentment grew. Now, the loss of Hertileus and his troops was a huge blow to the resistance, but Sertorius still liked the odds, and he was determined to carry on the war, and he came very close to winning it all on several occasions. In one engagement, he risked an open battle with Pompey to try to finish him off. After a hard day's fighting by the river Sucro, Sertorius eventually gained the upper hand and ended up routing Pompey and came very near to killing him. Pompey was wounded, fell off his horse, and he ran. But this was sort of like the lizard that jettisons his tail when a bird grabs it. It was a nice horse, decked out with gold. Some of Sertorius' soldiers captured it and got so distracted, fighting about who should keep the horse, that they let the general himself slip away. Sertorius had a good shot at defeating Pompey comprehensively the next day, but just in time, Metellus appeared on the scene with his army, and so the rebels retreated to fight another day. The only real tactical defeat Sertorius personally experienced is still a pretty impressive story. In 75 BC, at Saguntum, somewhere in the plains near Saragossa, Metellus and Pompey's armies were combined in their full strength. And what seems to have happened is that Sertorius opened with a raid on one of their foraging and plundering expeditions, but then he sees an opportunity and he decides to risk a full engagement. Pompey's most capable general, Memmius, falls in combat. And in the heat of battle, Sertorius starts pushing his way directly to Metellus himself, because this time Metellus is personally fighting close to the front lines, and the commanders and the armies are locked in a great mortal struggle, and Metellus's lines are starting to fail, and all of a sudden Metellus himself is hit with a spear. But it doesn't kill him, it just takes him out of the action. But this event turns things around. His troops get the fury in them. They rally around their wounded general and they manage to push back the Sertorian lines. And the fighting goes on from noon until midnight. During the night, though, once the fighting stops, Sertorius gives his orders. And by the next morning, most of his forces have vanished into the hills and the forests. And he takes a small band with him and retreats behind the walls of a nearby city. Now, Metellus and Pompey, they are giddy. It looks like Sertorius is defeated. They chase him into the city, surround it. They're expecting an easy siege. They're ready to wrap up this war quickly, at last. And they let the rest of Sertorius' barbarians scatter without chasing them. They have their prize and he's trapped in the city. But in fact, they were playing right into Sertorius' hands once again. They took the decoy. His lieutenants were all busy regrouping and gathering reinforcements and supplies from the nearby regions. When they somehow get the message to him in the city that they're ready, he sallies out in a surprise charge and he cuts his way through the enemy siege lines and joins his men a number of miles away at the head of an army no less fearsome or determined than it was before. And there are plenty of other tales of daring and brilliance much admired by later strategists like the Roman Frontinus and the Florentine Machiavelli, too many to recount here. Metellus retreats to southern Gaul in frustration, and he even announces a huge bounty on Sertorius's head. Now that's not in the warrior code, is it? And Pompey is exasperated too, and he writes a long letter to the Senate, 
demands massive reinforcements and money. At the end of his letter, he said to the old man, Unless you come to our rescue, then I will have no choice but to withdraw my army to Italy, bringing with it all the war currently going on in Spain. And at that point, there were a lot of people in Rome who were afraid that if Pompey did retreat, Sertorius might just get to Italy before he did. Well, Sertorius was able to turn a retreat into a sort of victory because for the guerrilla warrior, who is generally fighting a war of attrition, you know, to survive to fight another day is really the key to victory. But all the same, the war looked like it was starting to turn against him because now the Roman Senate, finally acknowledging the magnitude of the threat he posed, they decide to send another 20,000 troops and huge amounts of money and supplies to support Pompey and Metellus. Many were losing hope in Sertorius's mission of restoring freedom and justice to the Republic. The next year, Spaniard cities started to defect in larger numbers. Many had supported him because they genuinely thought Sertorius stood a better chance of winning than his opponents. But now the gold was pouring in for the regime troops from the rest of the empire, and to some it looked like the Sertorian cause was sinking, and his staff were starting to get impatient with these retreating tactics. They didn't see eye to eye with him on the winning strategy. Metellus and Pompey announced a standing pardon for any officer who would defect to their side. Rejoin Rome. Regain citizenship. Amnesty. No questions asked. A lot of guys took the offer. Sertorius already had a group of fanatical Lusitanian devotees who had sworn to give up their life for him. But now, with Metellus putting a bounty on Sertorius's head, his men insisted on increasing his bodyguard. Trust was starting to break down, and these new bodyguards that Sertorius got were elite Iberian warriors, you know, barbarians in their manners and customs. Those posh Roman refugee lieutenants probably made fun of the Lusitanians for those rumors that some of these people brushed their teeth with urine. And the Roman officers didn't like these tough guy foreigners controlling access to their commander. Some of them thought he was no better than they were. But there was still a lot of hope with the Sertorian resistance. And Plutarch counts this as one of the main factors, paradoxically, that led to his undoing. See, he had built such an effective war machine, such a dense network of allies, trained his soldiers and units so well that Perperna and some of the other senators thought they were plenty a match for the enemy on their own. Perperna, in particular, was dreaming of taking the chief command. You know, something befitting his rank and birth. He starts whispering against his commander, insinuates resentment among the Romans against their Lusitanian and other Spaniard rivals in the regime. Some of them had already deserted, and Sertorius now discovers other men in his ranks who are actively plotting to betray him in the service of Pompey and Metellus. He executes a few Romans for treason. He even executes some of the hostages, those sons of the Spaniard nobility that he had trained up. This was really crossing the line in Plutarch's eyes. Was there no other way? And maybe Plutarch is right. Maybe coming down too hard on dissenters just played into Perperna's hands. But Sertorius saw these men not just as challenges to his own leadership, but as traitors to the Roman people. He was every bit as determined to carry on and win as he was on that day at Arausio on the banks of the Rhone, that night in Castulo when he turned a bloody massacre of Romans into a stunning Roman victory, as when he lost his eye, when he met the pirates, and as he was in countless other tests of strength, courage, and fortune in this long war in Spain. He still had every hope that they could defeat Metellus and Pompey and he was secretly in communication with leading men in the Senate in Rome. They were promising to support him and restore him and his followers to the state if they could win their way back to Italy. But in 72 BC, when he was 53 years old, after a lifetime of service to the Roman people, 
and an entire decade spent at war with Sulla and his followers, Sertorius did not recognize that his greatest threat came not from the sworn enemies that he had kept at bay for so long. No, it was among some of his most trusted comrades. Discontent was high enough among the officer corps that Perperna was able to organize a small conspiracy of officers that included a few of Sertorius's most intimate associates. They invite Sertorius to a banquet, celebrating some recent victory. And toward the end of the evening, they start up a brawl amongst themselves as a diversion. And when Perperna loudly dropped a wine glass, that was the signal. One of them stabbed Sertorius with a sword as he was lying on a couch, turned away, trying to ignore the ruckus. Then the rest of the group of conspirators fell on him with their daggers and they finished him off. A great Roman historian, a Nobel laureate, called Sertorius one of the great men, perhaps the greatest of all Rome had produced, and one who in more fortunate circumstances could perhaps have become the regenerator of his country. But fortune had other plans for the Roman Commonwealth, and its troubles were far from over. Now there is some closure and perhaps some twisted satisfaction to be had in the immediate aftermath of Sertorius' death. We'll save the full story for our shorter epilogue episode coming next week. But to put your heart at ease, just know that Perperna very quickly becomes a cautionary tale. The full story of Sertorius' amazing legacy and further character analysis we're going to save for the comparison episode in which we will put Sertorius up against the Greek man Plutarch paired him with, that's Eumenes. We'll see what they had in common and how they differed, but we'll have to tell Eumenes' story first before we get to that. But I want to point out something here before closing. It was Theodor Mommsen, the great German historian who we heard from just now, who said that Sertorius could have become the regenerator of his country. And someone might well ask, can you call a man great for what he could have done? Do we remember someone just for their potential? And yet, had Sertorius not already accomplished something lasting and significant before he died? For in this incredible story of the Sertorian resistance in Rome, we've seen proof of the extraordinary things that talented and determined people are capable of doing when they justly feel that they have been wronged and have been given no recourse. And he came very close to winning. Sertorius' name would be a warning to all tyrannical regimes thereafter. And his life provides many other valuable lessons for leaders, lessons on strategy and tactics, the importance of preparation, surprise, speed, knowing your territory, but also the power of trustworthiness and empathy and patience. If you want to dig deeper on any of these issues or work on applying these lessons to your life, sign up for our email list at ancientlifecoach.com. And of course, stay tuned for the next episode coming soon. Meanwhile, if you think this show merits it, go on to iTunes or your favorite podcast platform and leave us a good review. It really helps us out. Until next time, this is Alex Petkus. Mm-hmm.